to talk about. Um, Jose, I'm going to let him introduce himself, but I will tell you uh, why I immediately wanted to invite him to speak at this conference. Um, first, because Silicon Valley Debug is the, I will say, the most respected grassroots organization in California who are working on these issues. Um, and uh, every year it seems like, like I, I get more comfortable saying that they're the most respected and that they've, they've earned it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> whereas, you know, other groups come and go, you know, th sometimes there's like really great people who are there for a year or two and then they move on. Silicon Valley Debug has really made themselves known. Uh, and then of the, the people there, Jose has proven to be one of the best at connecting all of the different points that need to be connected. And that's what I always look for in allies. People, you know, they, they have their own focus. They, they know what their job is, but they can connect instantly to attorneys, to active gang members, to politicians, to staffers, to scholars, um, and, and work with all of those people and bring them together and make all of the work of all of these different areas uh, synergize. So that's why I really wanted to hear from Jose. Um, and that is, that is about the highest compliment I could give anybody. Uh, but I appreciate it, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what everybody's here is to hear from you. So uh, I will let you tell a little bit about yourself um, as part of your presentation. And then afterwards, I think we're going to have plenty of time in this session for questions and answers. And I certainly have an hour worth of questions I could ask. Um, so there, there will be no, there will be no shortage of, of things to talk about after the presentation presentation's done. So with that, Jose, uh, please take it away. Thank you. And uh, uh, I have a little bit of, uh, before I get started, just want to let people know, I have a little bit of uh, uh, technology challenge. So I got a laptop, no camera. Um, and so that's what I'll be using to share the screen. Uh, but you will be able to see me on camera, but unfortunately not at the same time. So, hey, you got options. You like looking at me? You could check me out. You know, if uh, if I'm not the prettiest thing you want to be looking at, you could take a look at the presentation, and you know we could get this party started. So let me uh, let me share this first. Share my screen. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it, uh, you for, uh, Sean, for introducing me. I appreciate the compliment. Uh, debug, uh, debug is a hell of a place. I started volunteering maybe uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm here now, you know. Um, I, I did a little bit of gang intervention before. Uh, it turned out that that's not what I wanna do. That's not what I was, uh, why I wanted to go in this direction of work. You know, they always had a sort of one, one-sided sort of narrative. And I always found myself frustrated. And I found myself at some point just praying every day, praying every day, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. And all of a sudden, a debug calls me back, says, hey, you want a job? I, I ran to debug first thing. So I uh, appreciate the compliment and, and definitely appreciate being a part of debug. Um, Okay, so today's, uh, I'm going to, before I get into what I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about myself. So uh, I proudly have no formal education in Chicano studies. Uh, the reason why I say that is just, it's, it's always really funny or silly to me when, uh, you know, the, the gatekeepers of what being Chicano is, is somehow how in a school or a class where someone had to teach you to be Chicano, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, you know, someone can't teach a black person how to be black. You know, you can't teach a Vietnamese person how to be Vietnamese. Um, you know, uh, I had no choice. Um, I, I'm Chicano to the bone. Um, so that's one of the first things I wanted to talk about. I'm from East Side San Jose. So for those that don't know, that's East Side San Jose. Uh, we're basically, uh, I guess some people want to call it the South Bay or Santa Clara County. I was raised near King and Story which is the lowrider capital during the 1970s and 80s. Uh, San Juan has the largest population of Raza in Northern California going back to the 1800s. And uh, we still hold that till this day. My mom was a farm worker 
My grandparents were farm workers. I'm a third generation Chicano. I wrote for the Cultura and Times uh, section for Street Low Magazine for about four years. Uh, I wrote the cover story uh, for the last issue of Teen Angels Magazine. Um, and I, I posted various historical exhibits in prison and Chicano art shows. Uh, I also led a coalition to include various historic Chicano murals in the historic landmark inventory to secure their preservation. Uh, in San Jose, a lot of, we're losing a lot of murals. It's a big issue, I think, statewide and also nationwide. Um, so um, I went ahead and did my part there in, in my own community. I am a, a prisoner's human rights advocate. Uh, so uh, until, until this day, I'm a clearinghouse for the prisoner, for Prisoners United, which is a, a prisoners led loose organization. And I assisted with various hunger strikes uh, of all uh, racial groups to end indefinite solitary confinement and change the classification system, including reclassifying uh, protective custody Sureños into, uh, segregate, to, into a segregated Sureños unit with no PC jacket. Uh, that was actually uh, one of the most inspiring times in uh, my career. Uh, I was also threatened by the sheriffs as well. They were trying to fire me, um, which I don't know how they're gonna fire me because they're not my boss, but... <laughs> I have, uh, I've been community organizing with Diva for about 15 years. I married a father of three boys um, and coming in September, I'll be 15 years sober and 15 years out of the system. So that's pretty much a bio and a little bit about me. Um, this, this whole uh, presentation that I'm doing about the Huelga Bird, a lot of times I just simply just talk about it as a Huelga Bird workshop. I've done it and readopted it and recreated it a millions, millions of times. Uh, you know, I've done it with youth, like you see this uh, young girl right here, which is uh, my homegirl Shorty's daughter. Um, we took a bunch of kids way back in the day to the fields uh, so they could go ahead and experience what it was like for their, their, maybe their parents or grandparents, or instead of just reading about it in a book, maybe they could go ahead and experience it themselves. And I, and I, um, you know, teach kids about the meaning of the Huelga bird. What does the Huelga bird mean? What do the colors mean? According to Cesar Chavez. And so that's a that's an old picture there. I like that picture there. Um, okay, so we're gonna kick it off uh, with anti, uh, an anti-Rasa uh, sentiment. There's been an anti-Rasa sentiment since US inception. Um, so I'm gonna read a few quotes moving forward. So he has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endowed to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an indistinguished and uh, uh, is an indistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So this is actually uh, taken from the uh, Declaration of Independence. And you would think that the Declaration of Independence is all about freedom and, and freeing this country from the British oppressor, um, you know, but it was also a document that pretty much, uh, you know, marked who was the enemies of the United States. And it was also used as a propaganda tool already. They were calling Native Americans merciless Indians and savages that have no, uh, you know, mercy for children, women, and uh, or any type of conditions that they may be. So this was in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, this right here is, uh, I'm going to read this, is all persons who are commonly known as greasers for the issue of Spanish and Indian blood who may come with the provisions of the first section of this act and who are armed and not to be go peaceable and quiet persons and who can give no good account of themselves may be disarmed by lawful officer and punished otherwise. So this is taken from the, the Greaser Act was a uh, California state law during the 1800s. And the term greaser was an accepted term to basically encompass um, everyone under this sort of uh, this stigma, right? Um, or this, uh, this slur. So I know a lot of folks today, you know, when they uh, think about decolonize and they think of the Spaniards as, I mean, I think of the oppressors as, or the colonizer as, as Spaniards and Catholics. When the United States took over, they really didn't care for none of that. They didn't care if you were Catholic. They didn't care if you were Spaniard. To them, you were all the same. If you were of Native American blood, Mexican or Spaniard, you were known as a greaser. You had no right to work. You had no right um, to be homeless, to be unemployed. <laughs> and you had no right to bear arms. 
uh, you know, um, and it's interesting that the, the punishment for being a greaser during this time was uh, slave labor. Um, so they would incarcerate you and you would have to do your time in hard labor. So this is a picture of Devucio Vasquez. I'm gonna speak on him um, in just a minute right here. I'm gonna go through some quotes. I like quotes because sometimes the proof is in the pudding. Instead of hearing from, you know, my own personal opinion, you just, you know, uh, look, look at it for exactly what it is. Uh, Tehuercio Vasquez's grandfather was uh, Juan Atenasio Vasquez. Uh, he was most likely of Nahuatl ancestry. So he was most likely a Mexica, uh, an Aztec, if you will. You know, uh, he co-founded Spanish California during the De Anza expeditions. If anyone was is familiar with De Anza College, that's what it's named after. Uh, one year prior to the establishment of the United States in 1776. Juan uh, Atenasio's son, Jose de, de Urcio Vasquez served as the mayor of San Jose in 1802 uh, under Spanish rule. Uh, Jose de Urcio's nephew or son, there's different accounts. Some people say that the de Urcio that we know today is this the, the mayor of San Jose's son. Some people say nephew, there's different accounts. But anyways, uh, de Urcio was an educated businessman and landowner who spoke multiple languages, including Spanish, English, and various Native American tongues. After the Treaty of Guadalupe, the Urcio's family lineage went from being a noble Spanish in, in the military and government to a greaser, prisoner, and outlaw with no right to land, business, or the right to work. The Urcio Vasquez was hung near St. James Park in 1875 in San Jose, California. Um, so uh, it's pretty interesting right here, you know, that uh, there's actually more popular individual uh, that had carries this sort of legacy or story. And that's Joaquin Murieta. There was uh, various books written. There's a famous poem that's written, written about Joaquin Murieta. And uh, people actually have argued and debated that uh, there is no Joaquin Murieta. It's a fictional name. And that fictional name is actually depicting the Burcio Vasquez because there is actual evidence uh, that the Urcio existed. There's various documents. There's court documents. There's documents of the Santa Clara County Sheriff, uh, you know, advertising him being hung for the community to see. Uh, there's all kinds of documentation and pretty much everything that's told about Joaquin uh, is the Urcio story. So it is a true story. And he was hung right here in San Jose, where I'm from. And uh, let me go ahead and move forward. So this is a quote that he said while he was on trial, Santa Clara County in 1875. A spirit of hatred and revenge took possession of me. I had numerous fights and in defense of what I believed to be my rights and those of my countrymen. I believe we were unjustly deprived of the social rights that belong to us. So interesting thing, like I said, like he came from a very noble lineage. You know, his, his ancestors were basically uh, Aztec warriors. Uh, a lot of the warriors were recruited into the Spanish army after colonization. Um, you know, he was granted a lot of land. He was very noble, but that meant nothing when Anglos had went ahead and took over California. And uh, they took away this person's right to have a family, to support his family, the uh, right to have a business, the right to have property, the right to work. And so what happened, just like the Wurzio and many other Native Americans, Spaniards, and Mexicans during this time was they pretty much had to live a life of crime. You know, in order to survive, uh, they had to do a little dirt. You know, uh, Tehuercio Vasquez was known pretty much as a Robin Hood. Um, he, he stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Uh, so I think that's that's pretty uh, pretty interesting fact in what we're talking about today. And the fact that um, he did time several times in San Quentin. During the 1800s, I, there's uh, I think he he escaped at least twice, um, and uh, but he did at least four bids throughout his lifetime in San Quentin. Okay, so moving forward, so just like as I said, there's been an anti-Rasa sentiment since U.S. inception, but anti-Rasa youth sentiment probably didn't start until the Zuzu riots or the Sleepy Lagoon case. And so right here, here's the. Uh, Here's a photo of uh, uh, young Pachucos. And there's, a, you know, there's actually a, a really large misconception that the, the Pachucos were adults. A lot of them were not adults. These were kids, 
you know, just like kids today, they might be into skating or maybe they're cholos or maybe they're into high feet, whatever it is. This was one of those things that during that time, it was just a cool teenage thing. So, you know, uh, these kids were very young. They were all children, uh, pretty much, you know, teenagers, 12 to 17 for the most part. Um, and uh, uh, a little note that I put here um, is that Pachuco still exists today. There's a misconception also that, you know, they no longer exist. They, in fact, do. But today we have other names for them. We call them lowriders, cholos, homeboys, homies, or even gang members. So what people don't know about that famous Sleepy Lagoon case, it was actually a gang indictment. So it was, they first rounded up, and there's some accounts that they rounded up at least 800 individuals from the 38th Street neighborhood. Uh, it ended up balling down to slamming about 10 individuals, uh, and they were all from 38th Street. Um, uh, the audio is still an active audio in LA today. Uh, these are like recent like artwork depicting, you know, 38th Street. Uh, there's also another uh, sort of uh, offshoot of 38th Street that still exists today, and that's Duke's Car Club. So Duke's Car Club is inter international. They got clubs all over the world, believe it or not. They got clubs in uh, Australia. It is worldwide, um, and that stems from the original 38th Street Dukes. Uh, the movie Zoot Suit is about the Sleepy Lagoon case or the 38th Street Dukes indictment, if that's what you want to call it. Um, the lead, uh, the lead singer of the Midnighters, if anybody likes them oldies, uh, the mean the Midnighters, that's right. The Midnighters pretty popular, pretty popular Chicano group. And, uh, the lead singer, Lil Willie G, he's actually from 38th street. So, uh, it's interesting to show that, you know, not only are we this, right. We're also this, you know, um, so say what you want about, uh, Cholos or gang members today. I mean, we've obviously contributed in a very positive way on many different aspects of society and Chicano culture. Um, this is a pretty interesting quote. It says right here, this is from Cesar Chavez. And this is what he says about zoot suits or zoot suiters and pachucos. You see people that wore them, eran de las más pobres. The guys like us who were migrant farm workers, the families who were middle class, Good to understand because there's also a conception that everyone dressed like this or that all youth dress dressed like this. That's actually not so. It was only um, the poorest youth uh, within the barrio. You know, uh, other Mexicanos that were more middle class, they didn't really wear the zoot suits. Uh, middle class youth didn't really wear the zoot suits. It was mostly the kids that, you know, uh, were struggling. Uh, no different to, from today's homies, you know, uh, it's it's the homies that, you know, they often come from the most struggling uh, and broken homes and communities that, you know, dress like cholos, right? The meaning of the Huelga bird and uh, the UFW's kickoff to the Chicano movement. Um, so here right here is the depiction of the Huelga bird and the flag. Um, I think it's important to understand that uh, the Huelga Bird, Dolores, Caesar, the UFW, that they're equivalent to the Chicano movement as Rosa Parks was for the civil rights movement. When Rosa, when Rosa Parks went ahead and said, Charlie, I'm not sitting in the back. I'm, sit, I'm staying here in the front. That's the way it's going to be. I'm tired. You ain't telling me just because I'm black, I'm going to go sit back here. I'm going to sit right here and I'm going to sit proud no matter what happens. You know, it sparked the whole movement, right? And that's exactly what uh, this icon, uh, Caesar, Dolores, and the United Foreign Workers, when they went ahead and stood up, they kicked off the Chicano movement. So we're gonna little, learn a little bit about uh, the union and uh, a little bit about what's the actual meaning of it. So in 1962, uh, Cesar Chavez founded the National Farm Workers Association, later the Filipino Union, the AWOC and the Mexican Union, the NFWA, which was the original name before it was UFW, uh, joined as one cause on September 16th to picket the, uh, the Delano growers. A few months later, the AWOC and the NFWA joined as one single union, the UFW, united meaning 
United Filipino and Mexican Farm Workers. Filipino leader uh, Larry Itilong, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, became the vice president. Caesar was joined by Dolores Huerta and the union was born. That same year, Richard Chavez designed the UFW Eagle and Caesar chose the black and red colors. Uh, it's important to note that Caesar actually chose those colors because uh, uh, he was inspired by the many uh, labor rights protests in Mexico uh, that were popular during that time. Uh, of course, so, so was uh, socialism in Mexico as well. Um, so uh, to this day, you know, black and red is are considered socialist colors. I'm not calling them communist or anything. I'm just, you know, just putting it out there. Uh, Caesar told the story of the birth of the eagle. He asked Richard to design the flag, but Richard should uh, not make an eagle that he. Uh, but Richard couldn't make a league eagle that he liked. Finally, he sketched one on a piece of brown wrapping paper. He then squared off the wing edges so that the eagle would be easier for uh, union members to draw on a handmade red flag that will give courage to the farm workers with their own powerful symbol. Caesar made a reference to the flag by stating, a symbol is an important thing. That is why we chose the Aztec Eagle. It gives pride. When people see it, they know it means dignity. And uh, here uh, is the definition of the numbers. What's the symbolism behind the, uh, the, the colors, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the black stands for uh, oppression the oppression of the farm worker. The white stands for hope, meaning that all the sacrifices uh, that the UFW had to make, you know, you had hope that, you know, they would actually bring forth results and you would get justice. And the red stands for sacrifice. Uh, here's another quote from uh, Caesar. It says, all Hispanics, urban and rural, young and old are connected to the farm worker's experience. We had all lived through the fields or our parents had, we shared that same common humiliation. So this right here is a picture of my mom, uh, just before her going to work, she was still pretty young at this time. Uh, and she's ready to go out there and work in the fields. Um, you know, for any, any raza that in Northern California, if, if you have family going back to the eighties, the seventies, the sixties, the fifties and forties, more than likely, uh, you were working in the fields, your mom was working in the fields, your dad was working in the fields, your brothers, your sisters. It was pretty much the primary number one uh, employment for Raza during that time. And so what also made the UFW powerful is just the fact that if you know anyone, anything about uh, Mexicano culture, you know, Mexicanos are very prideful. You know, they pride themselves in working hard. They don't, they don't like to see themselves as needing charity. They don't like seeing themselves as giving handouts or complaining. They want to work and they want to work hard and they want to work hard for their family and family is first. And so that really resonated to a lot of people during that time that it was a, a labor rights struggle, you know, um, and um, it was, and, and to the, and to add is that a lot of people in Northern California did work in the fields. So again, that's why it, it resonated to a lot of people. Um, this, is a, um, this is a quote right here, the UFW survival, its existence was in no doubt in my mind when the time began to come after the union became visible, when Chicano started entering college in greater numbers, when Hispanics began running for public office in greater numbers, when our people started asserting their rights on a broad range of issues and in many communities across the country. The union survival, its very existence sent out a signal to all Hispanics that we were fighting for our dignity, that we were challenging and overcoming injustice, that we were empowering the least educated among us, the poorest among us. The message was clear. If it could happen in the fields, it could happen anywhere, in the cities, in the courts, in the city councils, in the state legislatures. So moving forward, I'm gonna talk about La Causa. So here's a newspaper clipping. It was a Brown Berets newspaper clipping and the, the name of the magazine or the name of the newspaper was La Causa. And so I'm gonna be moving forward and speaking about the front page topic there, El Plan Espiritual de Atzlan. 
So uh, right here is a picture of Dolores, and you can see the huelga bird and the, the words or the terms like causa right there in the back. Here's Cesar Chavez next to a couple of brown berets. And uh, the brown berets on all their patches, they had the words La Causa. Here's uh, Corky Gonzalez. Uh, I'm gonna speak about him in a little bit, but very lead figure, a big lead figure during that time. that pretty much put the whole Chicanada in perspective. Uh, it's important to understand that Chicanos had existed before the movement, you know, uh, but uh, this person was the person that kind of put everything um, in perspective into El Plan Espiritual de Atzlan, or what we know as La Causa. When people refer to La Causa, this is exactly what they're referring to. So El Plan Espiritual de Atzlan sets the theme that the Chicanos must use nationalism as the key or common denominator for mass mobilization and organization. Once we are committed to the idea and philosophy of El Plan, we can only conclude that social, economic, cultural, and political independence is the only road to total liberation from oppression, exploit, exploitation, and racism. Our struggle then must be for the control of our volumes, campos, pueblos, lands, our economy, our culture, and our political life. El Plan commits all levels of Chicano society, the barrio, the campo, the ranchero, the writer, the teacher, the worker, the professional, to la causa. So right here, it's important to note that la causa, you know, was for everybody. If you were in prison, the la causa was for you. If you were in juvenile hall or YA, La Causa was for you. If you were in the fields, if you were a professional, if you were a teacher, a student, um, the La Causa was for you. There was no separation or segregation from, uh, you know, uh, the good Mexicans and the bad Mexicans. <laughs> uh, this right here is just a little bit about some of the organizational goals, unity, economy, ed education, institutions, self-defense, cultura, and political liberation. What La Causa inspired or what El Plan inspired was student organizations like Mecha is probably the most notable one, uh, various labor unions, militant organizations, low riding and barrio culture, uh, the Mexica movement, uh, political part, uh, a political party that, you know, there used to be a La Raza political party was independent, wasn't damn or Republican, uh, theater, music and movies. And it also inspired people in jails, prisons and institutions. I'm going to go ahead and play this clip real quick. If it lets me. Okay, let's try this again. You guys hear that? Does everyone hear that? No, we cannot hear you. Okay, let's try this again. When you start screen sharing, there should there should be a uh, a designation for sound as well. <clears throat> I think we'll skip it. Hold on a second. Okay, am I echoing? Are we good? Do you hear me? We can hear you. It echoed for a okay, second, but it stopped. That. Okay, so uh, I'll just talk about it. This was actually a clip. Uh, this was uh, taken in San Quentin during uh, 68 or 69. Uh, there was a, a, an organization called Empleo, which was a job preparation uh, program in San Quentin um, that was uh, basically Chicano-based, uh, you know. Uh, and so these individuals uh, in, the, in uh, this group called Empleo they sought to apply the Chicano movement or El Plan or La Causa in prison as well. Uh, there was a little clip that too bad you guys can't hear it, but uh, I'm gonna move forward here. So this right here to the left is uh, Chino Vasquez, which was instrumental in the United Farm Workers in Gilroy. And he's pictured right here to, uh, with Cesar Chavez. 
he died sometime in I think the late seventies or early eighties. I can't really put the year on it, but uh, there was all kinds of people at his funeral. I think Caesar was there. A lot of farm workers were in support of him. Um, his son was Black Bob Vasquez, which is pictured on the, the right photo. He's second to the left. He won a, a handball tournament um, in San Quentin during this time. And he's alleged to be a member of the Nuestra Familia. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to say that like I'm tarnishing anybody's movements, nor am I glorifying anybody's movements. But I say this to say that, you know, back in the days, the barrio was a lot more isolated. Our, our people were a lot more isolated. And you would have one brother that may have been, uh, you know, an activist and the other brother was a pinto. Maybe the sister was a lawyer. Maybe the brother was, you know, working in the fields and so on and so forth. So this was our community. Um, I thought these are pretty interesting. These are, uh, to the left is a vintage Chicano power patch. Uh, in the 1970s, and it's pretty interesting in that there you go ahead and see a brown fist and with some broken chains. And on the right, there's a, a, a button uh, for uh, some uh, uh, some movement that they did in Washington. Um, and there's a huelga bird, and again, you see the chains and breaking off the chain. So moving forward, Cesar Chavez's views on barrio youth and system impact in raza using the huelga bird. So I think this is important because law enforcement will always say that Norteños, that gang members have hijacked the huelga bird. That is a complete lie. And I'm gonna go in and tell you why. Straight from the horse's mouth, not my opinion, Cesar Chavez's. So although prosecutors make claims of the huelga bird being hijacked by Norteños in an interview with Cesar Chavez by Jessica Terriz, in the October 1980 issue of Lowrider Magazine, when Cesar Chavez was asked about gangs, Chavez responded, I identify with them. When guys are rebellious, they're telling you something. They'll grow out of it. Some will. When they go into a new phase, they're going to be the most active organizers. It takes a lot of organizing to stay in a gang, right? There are, they're already organizing they are already under some very adverse conditions. When asked about the incarcerated and system impact at Raza using, uh, from the barrio using well, the Huelga bird, Caesar explained, I'm delighted, I feel great. I let them do it because it's great, you know, it's in a lot of places. I think it's a great compliment. So some people, they trip out like they deny that Caesar would ever say this thing, say things like this. But I think it's under, uh, important to understand why he said identify with them because he was speaking about himself. Um, this is Caesar right here um, in Eastside San Jose during the 1940s. Um, and he's in a, in a zoot suit. He's dressed as a pachuco. And so is his brother right there next to him. Uh, today's criminalization of the Huelga bird. So last year, the former city of San Jose police chief, Eddie Garcia tweeted on a picture which criminalized the Huelga bird. Uh, you know, it was basically like a face covering, you know, for COVID and all that, and a Catholic rosary after a gun bust. The tweet bursted on outcry in the media, catching the attention of Father John Padigo's outrage of the, of the chief's tweet. As a result, the U of W's uh, president, Teresa Romero, sent a cease and desist letter uh, to Mayor Sam Licardo and Chief Eddie Garcia to remove the post and the post has since been removed. So this is the post right here. And um, what I find interesting is that uh, a lot of people kind of accept that, hey, you know, if, if the shoe fits, you know, but I mean, if, if we were to put, um, you know, a bunch of guns and what have you next to the Quran, uh, or something like that, people would be outraged and say that's racism, right? You know, if there was like a Martin Luther King shirt next to a bunch of guns and the chief bragging about it, you know, people would be offended. But when we see like things like the huelga bird or the rosary, you know, people seem to accept it. And and, and I that's kind of what why I, I've been doing this research and been working on this workshop and 
for so long and why I keep on showing it to people and why I think it's important because it's, it's important to know that it just shouldn't be accepted. It's not okay. You know, so what if he, um, you know, had a rosary and it happened to be red, you know, so what if he had a, a Welga bird, uh, you know, face covering, you know, what does that have to actually do with anything, you know, other than, you know, that's obviously his heritage and his faith. I'm going to move forward. So how gang enhancements are used to criminalize Latino culture in the courts. So what are prosecutors and law enforcement criminalize? They criminalize ethnic nationalism and ethnic social justice themes. They criminalize pre-Columbian Mesoamerican culture. And they, believe it or not, they also criminalize Catholicism and Christianity. Um, they, uh, I've seen people uh, criminalize Spanish surnames. Um, and the Spanish language. Not only that, they also criminalize the Nahuatl language. Uh, they obviously criminalize generational poverty and inequality. They criminalize ethnic masculinity and camaraderie. Um, and uh, they definitely uh, criminalize in its entire, uh, in its entirety, Mexican, Chicano, Mestizo, and Barrio culture. And I've seen it played out in the courts. All you got to do is go to a gang enhancement trial and believe it or not, it's all there. It happens all the time. So here's Joey and Hugo's story. So uh, Joey was a, a, a family member. His, uh, his brother is now serving multiple life sentences. Um, he's innocent. But uh, here's his story. So Joey Rodriguez, brother of Hugo Chavez, who was wrongly convicted with gang enhancements in Santa Clara County testified um, this year for the AB 256 Racial Justice Act for All bill. During testimony, Joey explained how gang evidence is abused by prosecutors who consistently use aspects of Latino culture and gang activity interchangeably, creating a racial bias against Latino males. This resulted in creating a racial bias so strong it caused a juror to unreasonably believe her life was in danger, stating, given the nature of the testimony and reoccurring people in the audience that, based on descriptions of what gang members look like and tattoos and so on, look possibly as if they are gang members and it makes me feel uncomfortable. The juror came to the conclusion that Joey and myself, me from Debug, uh, we were the only people in the audience and definitely the only Latino males in the audience um, that we were there to harm her. The jury continued, I have really tried to listen to every single thing that the attorneys have said. And I have to say a curtain has been pulled back on a different population. So it's so interesting that the gang evidence was so strong that I guess before she didn't think we were gang members, but now she's in full belief. Like, man, these guys are all gang members. And they're going to whack me and kill me. And just like that movie I may have seen. This jury member requested that the court remove the audience. So that's myself and, and Joey from the courtroom, expressing concerns of walking alone after leaving the courtroom, the courthouse, and offering personal information such as names and workplace during the jury. The jury only came to feel this way after law enforcement gang experts used fear mongering of Latino males interchangeably with violent gang members. So here's another story, uh, Noemi and Leo's story. In San Mateo County, there is an active case that, uh, that Debug has been supporting involving a young man named Leo and his fearless sister, Naomi. The prosecution used the well for as evidence of a gang enhancement. Here is Noemi and Leo's story in no Noemi's own words. Uh, si se puede, but not for us all, because we are being defined as gang members due to this huelga bird. This huelga bird represents the struggles of our people. Unfortunately, because of gang enhancement laws and the low bar for gang evidence, this symbol of pride in our culture is used as a symbol of crime. My brother is currently forced, facing gang enhancements due to this symbol. He loves Mexican-American history. And his own probation officer, who should have known his passion or for history, confiscated his flag, which is right next to his carpenter union flag. The bar for gang evidence is so much lower than other types of evidence. Si se puede is not for all of us, especially all the men like my brother 
who come from poor communities. He joined the Carpenters Union and found a passion. He found a brotherhood. He began to explore and learn. This was shut down by a justice system that defined him as a gang member due to his pride in his culture. Now, this is like a kind of a closing statement that I put together. Um, I'm just about done. Um, by accepting prosecutors and law enforcement's narrative, uh, we are accepting a lie. And worse, we're not only denying the most vulnerable, sis vulnerable system impacted, the poorest and struggling youth and men, the right to an ethnicity, to be empowered, to feel pride. In fact, we are also criminalizing it. Here's some statistics. So, um, you know, we did, because uh, we've been working on this AB333 to reform uh, the gay enhancement law. Uh, I forget what was the number, but it was something around one third, one third of the current jail population, uh, prison population right now is there for a gang enhancement. On top of that, 90, uh, I believe, what is it, 92, uh, 96%? Uh, everyone that does have a gang enhancement is either black and brown, black or brown. And as you can see here, 68% is Rasa. Uh, here's an interesting uh, sort of stat back in 1969. It said right there that the, the total number of Chicanos in the prison system was 720. Today, uh, that number has increased to 16,000. Uh, so uh, not only has it increased to 16,000, uh, Barraza is the largest uh, uh, ethnicity uh, behind them walls in California right now. Uh, barrio youth and system impacted Raza's use of, of the huelga bird. Okay, so these are a few pictures. Um, so that's actually my homie Larry. Uh, they call him Pops. He's right there in the corner. And he took a picture right there next to... Uh, uh, it, that's actually the Chicano Park mural out there in San Diego. And you can see like well got birds right next to it. But he took a picture. I guess he kind of like uh, related to it because you see a homie with his son. And then there you go. You see him as a homie with his son. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, that only northerners use the, the well got bird. But that's not true. This is actually a picture of uh, two youngsters. They, they might look like they're men, but it's because, that's because they had to survive as men in, uh, in, C in CYA. And uh, they're from Maravilla. And if you look closely, there's two Huelga birds right there next to the Maravilla. Maravilla is uh, one of the oldest neighborhoods in East LA. Uh, this right here is also taken in uh, uh, CYA uh, during the 70s. Uh, before they were known as Bulldogs, they were known as F-14. And uh, this right here is a, a group of young kids. These are kids. And you see well got birds on their chest. Uh, this right here, uh, I believe they're from Vicky's Town. Uh, at least the, the two gentlemen that are left and right. Again, they're kids. It's an old audio from out here in, uh, in San Jose. They're originally from uh, uh, the south side. This picture was taken in the 70s. Uh, but the homegirl right there in the middle, she's not just a homegirl. Uh, she's actually a member of the Junior Black Berets. Uh, Black Berets are hardly mentioned, but they were, they date back to 58 or 59, originated in San Jose. Uh, so they predate Black Panthers and the Brown Berets. The reason why they wore Black Berets because we didn't come up with that concept of Black power and Brown pride just yet uh, in the community. And they were inspired by Che Guevara and the Cuban Revolution. So that's why they wore black berets. And she's holding up, obviously, a, uh, a well bird flag. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is someone that I really looked up to. Her name is Little Mary. Um, she's part of Victory's out Outreach, but I really love her story. She was heavily involved uh, in kind of like the early beginnings of North and South body of warfare in San Juan during the 70s and 80s. She was also involved in the Chicano movement during that time. Um, and so she has a really powerful story, but as you can see right here, you kind of see this is this is actually from her school binder when she was going to school. And she cut out like newspaper clippings about her identity and you see the well got bird right there. So crime is this is another closing statement so crime is only a result of poverty and inequality. 
Should we condemn an entire class of people because they have been damaged by generational poverty and inequality? Should we deny them an ethnicity, an identity? Are we saying that they should not exist? That they are defined not by their character or the perseverance of their plight, but rather the wrongs they have done? Do they not have the potential to be fathers, husbands, wives, sisters, leaders? Is their heritage an outlet to build their esteem, to feel proud in a home and community in which so much has been damaged? Do they commit crimes because so-called gangs or do they commit crimes due to the generational poverty and inequality? Are they not worthy of rehabilitation, of recovery, redemption? Are they not the same population we dedicate our careers to? Whether they, whether, uh, themse whether they themselves or we call them gang members, cholos, homies, northerners, southerners, are they not human beings? So here's a picture of me with an old uh, booking sheet. Uh, I think this was, uh, might have been 2002, might have been 2009, I don't remember. This is me when I was young. Um, a couple pictures of me. And this is me when I, I graduated and got my GED in, in the county jail. You could see me um, kind of on the right side. This is me again when I started organizing with Debug, and you see the Webbega bird right there uh, in um, in my brim. And we were uh, fighting a no on Prop Six. Uh, we were fighting for no on Prop Six, which was uh, an action that we were doing way back then. This was actually on King and Story. I think we marched from King and Story to City Hall or or something like that. Uh, this is me and my two boys. Um, uh, this is actually taken at, um, I forget what the place is called, uh, but there's a, a museum there. And it's actually where Cesar Chavez is currently buried. So there's a, a museum there. Uh, you get to actually see the shack that I guess uh, Cesar Chavez used to stay in, some of his clothes. It's a real nice museum and, and Cesar is buried right there. It's really nice. Uh, and they have a real nice tour and a gift shop. And so I took my two boys there. Uh, way back when, uh, and this is them. This is th this past year. Um, I usually try to keep a tradition, just to you know teach them about Caesar. They don't do it in school, so somebody got to teach them. And this is actually taken in front of Caesar Chavez's uh, original home. His original home's not there anymore, uh, but there is a monument to uh, you know go ahead and state that it's a historical site where you know his his home once was. But to the left of him, his brother still lives there. And that's right there in San Juan on the east side. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. <clears throat> Thank you, Jose. I, I know I saw you want we wanted to leave with the music video there, huh? But um Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, I have to say, I learned I learned something. Um, you know, I grew up going to Vasquez Rocks, which is where Tiburcio Vasquez was supposed to hide out not far from here. Mm. I live in Montebello, which is where um, one of his most famous raids took place uh, on, on what right where I am now when it used to be a, a rancho. Um, you showed those pictures of the, the folks in the Whittier um YA right. so I'm actually moving next week right down the street uh to a house that's on the location of where that YA was before it got closed down wow now it's now a new housing development wow um, that's my kind of gentrification close down prisons yeah. and build new houses on them right um but yeah no but even with all of that hitting home you had a lot of details in there that that were great um so we definitely have time to hear um, questions from the audience. But before we do that, I'm going, I'm going to use my facilitator's discretion here, prerogative, uh, and ask you to, to focus a little bit more on law enforcement gang experts. Uh, you had some great stories in there, uh, particular examples of the way, way this happens. But what I've seen is any time people 
who have been targeted as gang members, you know, for generations. You talk about 38th Street, we talk about mm -hmm. um, any neighborhood, right? Where, where law enforcement decided those are where the bad guys are, that are right. on the wrong side of the thin blue line. So we need to target them. Uh, whatever they do, uh, whatever they love, whatever they take on as their identity or their culture becomes treated as if that was something wrong. Um, mm -hmm. Sports teams, uh, yeah. you know, there's, I worked in one neighborhood where, um, so they lived on Santa Fe Street. And so the clique that was of the gang from Santa Fe Street called themselves Santa Ferros. And so they started using San Francisco 49ers uh, mm. gear sort of as, as to representing them. Um, with, within, you know, maybe 20 years, everybody in that neighborhood, gang affiliated or not, is now a San Francisco fan, right? It's just everybody's <laughs> brothers, cousin, like they're from the heart, all San Francisco fans right now. Yeah. And yet any of them are now being labeled as gang members, you know, just for, for having San Francisco gear. Um, so it, it, it's reciprocal and, and all of it seems to be really this idea that anything the gang members do is gang indicia. Right. Um, so what do you think about that? And can you think of how, that's, how, how that plays out uh, in ways other than just the Huelga bird? Right, uh, I mean, that's an interesting point. Um, uh, same sort of story here in San Jose. In San Jose, um, um, there's like really strict uh, sports politics. So the sports teams don't want us to have our own football team or baseball team. And so, or even a basketball team. So we've been stuck with the most unpopular sport in America to represent. And so that's the San Jose Sharks. So they're a hockey team here. Uh, and, uh, you know, Chicanos uh, being fans of hockey, that must have been like, you're out of your mind. But, uh, you know, uh, the homies out this way, they really gravitated towards the Sharks. Um, started representing sharks, tattooing it, wearing the hats and jerseys. I think you've seen a picture of me wearing a shark's jersey in one of the pictures. And, but now, like, everybody wears it. Like, it, you don't even have to be a homie. Like, everyone is, I think even debug, we have, like, a debug shirt that has sharks colors, you know? Um, you know, so, uh, but, you know, if you, ca if you catch a, uh, if you're Chicano, definitely, and, you know, or Mexican, Latino, whatever is, you know, you identify with, if you get caught with uh, committing a crime, they're going to have to use that, uh, you know, and you could be a faithful hockey fan, you could be, you know, you're going to the games, all of that, they don't want to hear any of that, you know, to them, that's just gang member stuff, you know. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. Like I like um, in this day and age, there's a you know there's a big movement for deco de to decolonize. But the truth is that law enforcement don't care about none of that. You know, if you're whatever it is you are, if you're Christian, if you're Catholic, you speak Spanish, if you speak Ebonics, if you speak Nahuatl, hey, that's all gang member stuff as far as they're concerned. You know, um, and they'll use anything. Um, and so. Uh, it's really unfortunate, and I think there has to be an absolute change to stop, you know, regional culture and pride, to stop, uh, you know, uh, discrimination against regional culture and pride, discrimination against ethnic uh, and cultural pride and things like that, because it's it's a real big issue. It's probably the, Gang and Hass is probably the, the most straightforward racist law there is as far as how it plays out in the courts, you know. Yeah, I think that last comment is sort of what I was trying to get at with that question. It's yeah. um, it's just remarkable. It's when you look into, like I said, the types of evidence and things like that. It's unquestionable that this is a proxy for racial profiling. Yeah, that this is exactly the same thing that was done to Thirty Eighth Street mm -hmm. sixty years ago, and was done mm -hmm. to Vasquez a hundred years ago. Right. Uh, the the through line that you drew is is exactly right. It's always that. These people, based on who they are, their identity, their ethnicity, their history, are the targets. And then we'll just make up whatever they do and call it evidence <laughs> against them. Right, right. And you see, the problem is that sometimes, you know, like, 
somebody will be from a hood, you know, and they'll have it blasted. And you call it gang, you call it hood, barrio. I mean, you know, for me, you know, I prefer the term hood or barrio. I think that that's probably the most uh, accurate term. But like, the thing is that not every crime that someone commits that's from the hood is for the gang or benefits the gang or somehow sophisticated or even worthy of some type of gang enhancement or RICO. A lot of the times it's like, maybe they have a drug problem. You know, maybe they can't make the rent. You know, uh, you know maybe they're stressed out. Maybe they're homeless at the time. A number of different things that affect all people that are facing, you know, uh, you know these sort of conditions of, uh, of poverty and inequality. Uh, you know, but the problem is, is that because they're from the hood, you know, they get punished even more, you know, and so that also makes it harder for them to actually rehabilitate. Uh, and because the more time you're going to spend in prison, the more time you're going to get adjusted to prison survival, you know, and, uh, uh, and it, the harder it is for you to come back out and, you know, be successful in our society, you know, so it's definitely harder when you're, when you are from the hood. Um, so I'm looking around the room uh, and um, I'm happy, I guess I'm happy to say that I'm just meeting most of you here. Uh, but I also, for example, I see Lisa Romo here who is leading a lot of the work to try and use the Racial Justice Act to make this kind of racialized evidence inadmissible in California courts. Um, so, so seeing all of the people here, I, I think I'd like to open it up either for questions uh, or if people want to um, make comments, uh, bring some of what you have to offer, um, I would love that. Uh, in order to facilitate it at first, um, I think maybe we can start with people either uh, raising their hands or asking questions in the comment or saying that they have a comment to make it, and then I'll call on you to unmute. Um, if that doesn't work, we'll just open people up to unmute themselves and, and speak if that doesn't result in too many people talking over each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, so I see Colleen, do you wanna, um, instead of just typing in the chat, can you unmute yourself and bring that to the group? Um. Hi, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to have all the RIPA data that we have now and we can um, start connecting dots and, and pointing fingers, but that, you know, after the- Sorry, can, I, after Colleen, the can I interrupt you one second? Mm -hmm. Because I know that not everybody here is from California and so people okay. are not gonna know what RIPA is. So could you back up and, and talk about what's RIPA, happened here in California? RIPA is a, um, uh, something that a, or Attorney General Kamala Harris uh, started and got going in that uh, large police departments have to now keep track of their perceptions of race and um, LGBT status, but the, the L and the G and the B, don't, the T status maybe, um, in, when in enforcement stops and that data then is conveyed in um, close to real time. We, we get that to work with um, and use for advantage, but, but as great as that's been, um, there's limitations, obviously the small, the counties with smaller police agencies don't have access to that, but the courts as well are now taking the baton. So I do a lot of work in infraction court pro bono for homeless. And in infraction court, which I think is like the intersection of, of all the isms, um, they're taking the baton from all these racial profiling stops and perpetuating it further. You look around at traffic court and um, not many white folk there. Uh, so, so you have this perpetuation that goes on, but the data ends, we can't get data uh, from the court on convictions uh, that are happening in that race, race-based convictions, not easily at least, uh, with a lot, a lot of piecing together. So I, I would love to be able to uh, compel the court. And the reason we can is because they don't keep that data, they don't track that data, 
um, and they don't compile that data. So if we could mandate that they do, we could get that data. Yeah, I think it'll be great for sure. Well, sorry, I thought I had muted myself. Jose, uh, can you speak a little bit on whether or not you think there are any research projects or areas where data could be collected um, that would help address the issues that you've talked about? Right. Um, hmm. um, I know that there's a, a, um, probably like maybe stops, you know, uh, related to, because uh, um, we still have the database, uh, the gang database, and the database is kind of like a precursor to um, uh, gang enhancements. And so, um, before, I'm sure they still do it, but before what they used to do is uh, stop folks for simple traffic stops or they're just, uh, you know, uh, walking down the street or what have you while coming out the grocery store and they would stop folks and without even knowing, they would put people in the gang database. Um, and uh, yeah, FI card info. Uh, so they will put you in the database without even you even knowing it. And uh, so it'd be interesting to sort of gather, you know, um, uh, what's the relation between um, these sort of stops and these FI cards and gang enhancements. I mean, it's pretty obvious, but I think that, you know, looking at the data is always a, a great way of looking at things and trying to get at the nitty gritty. Yeah, you know, that makes me think of a sort of internal debate that I was a part of um, when working on the very first um, RIPA implementation time period, right? So, uh, so this law was passed mandating the collection of data and then there were endless committee meetings over, well, like, how do we do that? What are the details? What are the specifics? Um, what specific questions are police going to be asked uh, and what data can be kept track of? And one of the issues that, that really was sort of divisive was do we want them to have to record whether or not they believe the person is a gang member? Um, so you have to write down what the officer thinks their perceived ethnicity is, what the officer perceives their age as being, what the officer perceives their gender as being. Um, I, and I've talked to law enforcement agents who are just like, wait, you want me to, to identify what I think their sexual orientation is? How am I supposed to know that by looking at them? That's like, you're just asking me to, uh, you know, to be prejudiced, to, 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 <laughs> you know, to, be, to indulge my biases, whatever. But they're not asked, do you think this person is a gang member? Um, and it was actually the reason many, I was in favor of um, asking that uh, because I thought that data would be incredibly important. If we could map where FI cards are being filled out, how often, who's doing, well, not necessarily who's doing them by name, but officers, you know, they're tracked by uh, a special code, right? That would be data that would be so useful in actually seeing what it is the police are doing. Because police say that they're doing everything right. Um, well, every time we look, have data we can look at, we see that that's actually not the case, at least around gangs. Um, yeah. But the fear was, uh, and this is something that, that LAPD has, has a history of, is saying, well, yeah, th that stop that looked like racial profiling, it wasn't because we thought that person was a gang member. We were gang profiling, which is good policing, <laughs> not racial profiling, which is bad yeah. policing. Um, and so what would happen is, that would incentivize stopping everybody, you know, and calling them, yeah, I think they're a gang member because then the police officer would feel like that stop was now based on reasonable suspicion and not based on uh, racial profiling. It was an easy excuse for police, um, right. but it leaves us in the dark for all the potential data of what it is that police are actually doing out in the streets. Yeah, um, yeah Lisa. Sure. I see that you put something about we need access to FI cards. Um, can you tell us more about that? And also, um, I would like to hear from you if you think that the Racial Justice Act, uh, and well, if you could explain a little bit about that to the people in the audience and whether or not you think that will be able to address some of these things we're talking about, about culture being mistaken as gang indicia. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the first comments I wanna make is, is 
your comment, Sean, about we need to know what cops are doing. Um, my, I have a personal story where I was um, carjacked by gun, at gunpoint by um, a group of Latino youth. And the cops came out and they're asking me all these questions about describing them. And I'm you know, trying to estimate height and weight. And they kept saying, do you think they were gang members? Do you think they were gang members? I'm like, how would I know? I mean, they didn't, you know, they didn't say, hi, I'm a gang member. But I wonder how many times the police basically encourage victims of crimes to speculate. And then they put down in the report um, that they, the victim thought it was a, a gang member. And that information becomes very important in proving a gang en enhancement because, um, uh, because basically that, that um, if the victim thinks that the person is in a gang, then it's for the benefit of the gang. So th I think that's problematic. The FI cards, um, you know, I, I just think those cards could tell us so much information, especially about uh, where the law enforcement polices. So one of the things, one of the challenges that we are having under the Racial Justice Act, which I'll describe in, in a bit, is um, is how um, is whether we can show that they're targeting people. As Sean said, the 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 kind of nexus that they use between um, being a gang member and being a, a black or brown person. And so if we can show that the, if they only police in black and brown neighborhoods, of course, they're only gonna come up with black and brown people as gang members. Um, so the Racial Justice Act is new. It just came into effect uh, in January 1st, and there are a variety of ways it can be violated. And um, part of it is statistical. So like Jose was man, uh, um, mentioning the, the huge disparities um, for black and brown people who um, are under these gang enhancements. So that's part of it, showing these disparities. But another part of it is when um, people involved in the criminal legal system use uh, racist language or discriminatory language, coded language um, in proceedings. And so one of the things that we can use is when, when gang officers use this kind of language, which is, um, you know, ostensibly, or where that they are, they are um, putting it forward as some kind of objective indicia of gang membership. We can fight back and so say uh, no under the RJA. It's prohibited, and it is in fact discriminatory, and it um, has the whether whether it's intentional or not. So we do not have to prove that the officer is intentionally racist, which has been the biggest hurdle that we have had bringing racial justice claims before this act was passed. Um, so, so what we can do is say, you know, whether the officer means it or not, this is the kind of language that invokes racial stereotypes that are um, very harmful to the criminal legal system. And we have, um, you know, social science that tells us when you start using this kind of language, jurors are much more likely to find a person guilty of a crime, um, um, regardless of what the evidence is. So I think it will be a, a useful tool. How useful? I, I don't know. And then what, Colleen, before you jump in, I just want to make one more point, which is um, the kind of work that, that Jose just did for us, that kind of presentation, I would love to see more of that going into amicus briefs filed in the appellate courts. That's what I do. I, I work with the appellate courts and I am constantly trying to change the paradigm, you know, explain to them that the law enforcement view of gangs is not correct. It's not the mm -hmm. only, you know, the only perspective. We need to hear more, um, but they don't, you know, they, they don't want to hear that from me. They need to hear it from experts, people who live it, people who know it. So we really need to work together to bring in more of that um, information that will be presented to the courts, especially the California Supreme Court, so yeah. they have a, a better understanding. Thanks. Let's do it. And I wanted to share locally in San Diego, we, I did bring a Racial Justice Act, um, a request for uh, relevant evidence, 745D request. Um, and oh, I'm just turning off my phone, sorry. <laughs> um, and that, that request alone was, was enough to get a um, strike stricken in a gang enhancement case uh, where the judge had initially indicated he couldn't strike it under Romero, uh, but that he would if we gave him um, a basis under the Racial 
Justice Act, he would strike it. Um, I think he got, he wanted to, to rush the case through and jump to the end and offered the, the deal um, in advance. So we got the uh, strike stricken and um, request in, in conjunction with the racial justice uh, request that we made. We also got 1800 pages of data connecting up the uh, strike enhancement and the gang um, and the weapons charge in this case with uh, race data. Um, so we can potentially sift through that for gems. Thank you, Colleen. So we're out of time, um, but I'm very glad that we ended this after hearing about how things haven't changed for a hundred years <laughs> with uh, some stories about how we are developing tools to finally change this because it's been the 